Let's see, Dan, can I start a little early? All right. Let's uh, take our Bibles and open them to the book of James, chapter 1, and verse 22. Um, some people have asked me to comment on the election, and um, I have a lot to say about it. I don't know if it would be appropriate at this <laughs> venue to talk about it, but we're going to do Pastor's Point of View Friday, and we'll have a lot to say about it. Um, Because I, I am of the persuasion that a lot more is, is going on with this than most people are aware of. I don't think it's a case of um, America's not patriotic enough. I think the election is being stolen. And I do believe it's being stolen through a particular piece of software. And I'll have a chance to <clears throat> go into that on Friday. If you want kind of a head headshot on that, um, I would encourage you to listen to Brandon House's radio program from today. Uh, he gets into that with witnesses, and my first exposure to it was through the ministry of Mike Spaulding. He has a show called Dr. Mike Live, I think it is, and he was talking about it on Monday. And I have to admit, it kind of went in one ear and out the other when I first heard about it. I thought it was just kind of crazy conspiracy talk. But Brandon's show today uh, and the sources that he brings on and quotes, I think, give a lot of credibility to it. And um, I'm going to try to explain a little bit more about it on Pastor's Point of View this Friday. So don't get too uh, discouraged about things. Uh, don't blame yourself. Um, there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. And even some of the very well-known uh, right-wing talk show guys, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Mark Levin, even, even they are somewhat behind the curve on this. And so anyway, that's my thoughts on it. Brannon House, B-R-A-N-N-O-N -N -N House, H-O-W-S-E, uh, and it's called Worldview Weekend, and you want his radio show from today, November 4th. And once you start, can I, and I, maybe I shouldn't even talk about it because people are going to think I'm a wild conspiracy guy, which I don't think I am. I think I'm pretty careful. Do you guys think I'm careful with things? I mean, I don't spout, spout stuff unless I think there's validity to it. But once you start seeing this, you, start, you stop blaming yourself for everything. Because I think that's what Satan wants. I think he wants you to get real down and real discouraged about your country. Uh, thinking that somehow it's your fault that this happened or that happened, when in reality... Um, John 10.10 10 says the devil comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. The first one there is steal. And so we'll have some more things to say about that, I think, on Friday. So, Brother Jim, are you going to be ready for that on Friday? I will be <laughs> All right. Well, have a nice evening. Let's close in prayer. No. But tonight, we're not focused on that. We're focused on the book of James. Chapter 1, verse 22. And uh, the book of James is a book about James, the half-brother of Christ, writing from Jerusalem to the scattered Jews in the dispersion. They happen to be believing scattered Jews, and he's teaching them not about positional righteousness, but about what? Practical righteousness. So once you become a Christian, how do you live as a Christian? So the first half of the book of James is you walk by faith. And this is not saving faith, but what? 
not saving faith, but serving faith. So we go from, well, what we start to develop is a mindset where we trust God in the midst of trials. So how do we develop a practical righteousness that pleases God? We trust God in the midst of adversity. In other words, we develop a mindset that has God's mind on the subject of adversity. So that would include rejoicing in the midst of trials, verses 2 through 12. And then not uh, falling for the temptation of charging God foolishly in the midst of trials. Verses 13 through 18. Any of that ring a bell? From there, we moved into obedience to the Word of God. And that's the dominant uh, subject in the second half of chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. So what does it mean to develop a serving faith which is obedient to God? Three things. Number one, there's a need for slowness in speech and slowness to anger, verses 19 through 20. Number two, there is a need for obedience to God's word, verses 21 through 25, and that's where we are this evening, and I'm hoping to finish chapter one tonight, because when we get to verses 26 and 27, we have a need for true religion, or to practice true religion, or true, you know, religion may not be the best word there, true piety, True spirituality, verses 26 and 27. So right there we're in Roman numeral 2, the need for obedience to God's word. And you can't obey God's word until you do first, until you do what first? Receive God's word. So we saw that in verse 21, right? To receive God's word, you have to remove from your life certain sins, all sins really, because those are appetite suppressants. This is all in verse 21. Number two, we receive the word of God in what? Anybody remember? Starts with an H. Ends in humility. <laughs> we receive the word of God in humility. And then number three, what's the result? The word of God is capable of saving. Uh, not just salvation by faith alone in terms of justification first tense of salvation but also in terms of what sanctification middle tense salvation you see that there verse 21 end of the verse so once we receive God's word verse 21 then we're called upon to be doers of God's word this is where we left off last time I think we actually read this verse last time. Receiving God's word is not for the purpose of sitting, soaking, and souring, but with the goal that what we receive becomes action. So after he talks about receiving God's word, verse 21, what does he say there in verse 22? But prove yourselves to be what? Doers of the word and not merely merely hearers who deceive themselves. Famous verse. So why at the very end of the verse would it say and so deceive themselves? Um, The deception is that true spirituality comes from hearing good sermons. Hearing good teaching, uh, going to the right church. And so a lot of people, you know, you listen to them talk, you know, what kind of teaching do they have at this church? Do you go to the right church? And the, the whole focus is on receiving, which is also obviously very important. But receiving God's word does not lead to true spirituality. Receiving God's word is just step one. What's the final step? Obedience. 
Because really what good is it at the end of the day to know something if you don't act on it? See that? So if our spirituality is based on what we receive and not based on what we do, then we've fallen for a deception. Because God never told us that people are blessed by hearing. He told them they're blessed by what? By doing. Now hearing is a first step to that. It's an initial step. But it was never intended to be a last step. And if you think hearing or showing up week after week and listening to good teaching is the height of spirituality, then you, you fall for the deception that James is talking about here. You deceive yourselves or we deceive ourselves. So you remember what Jesus said in the upper room in John 13, verse 17. If you know these things, you are blessed if you what? Do them. So you'll notice that blessing doesn't come through knowing. He doesn't say if you know these things, you're blessed. What he says, if you, if you know these things, blessed you are if you do them. So the blessing in the Christian life never comes through hearing, listening, listening to tapes, listening to cassettes, listening to podcasts, listening to sermons. All of that is very important, but the blessing comes from taking what one learns and applying it. And that's what James is speaking of here in verse 22. So that's kind of his lead point as he starts this paragraph on not just receiving God's word, verse 21, but being a doer of God's word. So James, do you have um, an illustration for us that we could follow easily? And James says, I'm so glad you asked. You have an illustration coming there in verses 23 through 24. And notice what the illustration is, as James is illustrating this point that we should be not just receivers, but doers, not just hearers, but actors on God's word. How does, what point does James use to illustrate this? Verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. Verse 24, for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he, immediate, he immediately has forgotten what kind of person he is. So James, to get across this point of not just, just being a listener, but a doer, uses this illustration of a mirror. Now, you'll notice there in verses 23 and 24, the word of God is analogized to a mirror. And one of the things that's nice about a mirror is a mirror will never try to not hurt your feelings. It will always tell you the truth. So if you're looking young, the mirror will tell you. If you're looking old, the mirror will tell you. If you're looking energetic, the mirror will tell you. If you're looking tired and fatigued, the mirror will tell you. You can count on this, the mirror will tell you the truth. And that, in essence, is what the Word of God does. The Word of God makes no attempt to sugarcoat. It makes no attempt to avoid hurt feelings. It tells you exactly what the truth is. As we look at ourselves in light of the standard of God's Word, which is analogized to a mirror. So a person that's a hearer of God's word, but not a doer, someone that receives verse 21, but never applies verses 22 through 25, what are they really like? Well, they're like a person that looks at themselves in a mirror and then walks away and forgets what they look like. Now, why is that? Because they are living outside of their position. So if God reveals to us our true position, which is holiness, positionally, and I go out and I don't act like it, I'm living inconsistent with my position. And what eventually happens to me is I forget my initial position. 
because I'm looking at my practice in the mirror and it doesn't reveal holiness and I've forgotten the fact that God has decreed me to be holy. You see that? So that is the danger of living outside of our position as Christians is we forget our original position. Because we're looking in a mirror, the word of God, which can't lie. It will always tell us the truth and it will reveal to us our true actions, which in some cases can be unholy. And if you look at that long enough as the standard, you'll forget that God has decreed you to be holy positionally. Uh, He's not saying you lost your salvation. He's not saying that you're no longer a Christian. You're no longer a believer. What he's saying is you've forgotten what you look like. You've forgotten your position. So it is sort of a shock to us a lot of times to realize that in the eyes of God the Father, we look just as righteous as Jesus Christ. Do we realize that about ourselves? Not because of ourselves, but because of Christ's righteousness that has been what? Transferred to us at the point of faith. The great doctrine there is imputation or transfer. So you tell that to people and and you say to them on a Sunday morning, did you know that God the Father looks at you as if you're just as righteous as his son? And as a preacher, you can hear all the gasps in the the crowd. They can't believe that's true. Now, why can't they believe that's true? Because they've forgotten what they look like. It's like looking at yourself in a mirror, walking away, forgotten what you look like. So when our practice doesn't mirror our position, we forget our original position. And that's what a person is like who is a hearer, but not a doer. So it is entirely possible for Christians to forget their position in Christ. Because their behavior is inconsistent with it. Um, Here is a parallel passage you might want to jot down. It's in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 9 and it says for the one who lacks these qualities those would be the fruit of the spirit the one who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted having forgotten his purification from his former sins now is this person here in second peter that peter is addressing saved clearly they are because they've received purification from their sins. They're positionally right before God. So their problem isn't that they need to receive purification from God, they already have it. Their problem is they've forgotten their, their purification. For he who lacks these qualities is blind, short sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. So that's the danger that we run into when we hear but don't do, when we get knowledge but we don't have wisdom, when we have gnosis but no Sophia, Uh, no what the book, what Hebrew calls hokama, which means wisdom or knowledge applied. If you don't apply what you're learning, you forget your initial position. You see this happening in the famous... um, story of the prodigal son remember the son that went out and lived riotously and remember he wanted to go back home after he had sort of bottomed out do you remember what he was saying he was sort of rehearsing his speech that he was going to give to his father when he got back home remember what he said in Luke 15 verse 31 The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Well, the fact of the matter is, he may have felt like he was unworthy to be the son, but he was still the what? He was still the son. He had just forgotten uh, his former position. So that's what James is dealing with here. Um. What are we like when we hear but don't do? We're like a person that looks at themselves in the mirror. We walk away and we forget what we look like. He's not saying you have to be born again. You already have that. What you have to do is follow the 
power of the Spirit that allows us to live a life consistent with our position. And when we're living a life consistent with our position, we don't forget our initial position. So that's James' illustration. And he goes on there in verse 25, and he says, But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So, I hope that what you are seeing developing here in James chapter 1 is a very important area of systematic theology called bibliology. What is bibliology? Bibliology is what does the Bible say about itself? And you can take all of the major areas of systematic theology and divide it into about 10 categories. This is the study of systematic theology, and it's trying to figure out what does the Bible say in each of these areas. Because there's no bibliology book. I mean, what book do I go to 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 learn everything there is to know about what the Bible says about itself? Well, the Bible is not set up that way. The Bible is set up as what we would call crisis literature meaning it's designed to address real problems to real people. Every book of the Bible is set up that way. So for me to figure out everything that the Bible says about the Bible would require me to go through the whole Bible and assemble all of the pieces on that subject and arrange them in a meaningful order. And that's what you do in systematic theology. And these all come from fancy Greek names, which don't let them intimidate you. Those, are, those names have simple definitions. Prolegomena means introduction. Legomena means word or spoken word. Pro means first, first word or introduction. What do you have to understand to understand systematic theology? Then there's bibliology. What does the whole Bible say about itself? Theology, the study of what? God, what does the whole Bible say about God? Theos, God, ology, study of. Christology, what does the whole Bible say about who? Christ. Pneumatology, pneuma means spirit in Greek. What does the whole Bible say about the Holy Spirit? Anthropology, anthropos means man. What does the whole Bible say about man? Hamartia means sin. Hamartiology is what does the whole Bible say about what? The doctrine of sin. Soteriology is what does the whole Bible say about salvation? Soterios means salvation in Greek. Angelology, you already know something about that, right? Did a study on that. What does the whole Bible say about angels? There's no angel book, right? The doctrine of angels is dispersed throughout the whole Bible. So if you want to understand what God thinks about angels, you've got to go through the whole Bible and assemble it on that subject. Ecclesiology is the study of the what? The church from the Greek word ekklesia. And eschatos means end. Eschatology is the study of the what? Study of the end. What does the whole Bible say about the end? which is not just the book of Revelation. The very first eschatological statement that you find in the whole Bible we're coming up to on Sunday mornings, it's Genesis 3, verse 15. How there's coming one from the seed of the woman, the Messiah, who's going to do what to Satan's head? Crush it. That's an eschatological statement. made very early on in the Bible. So here we are in James chapter 1, and James chapter 1 is making a lot of contributions about bibliology, the doctrine of Scripture. First of all, we saw in verses 23 and 24 that the Scripture is like a mirror. It always reveals the truth. But what else does the Scripture do for you? If you look at the first part of verse 25... It says, but to the one who looks intently 
at the perfect law. Now, you'll notice that we're supposed to take God's word and look intently at it. Um, It's not supposed to be a casual glance. So Psalm 1 talks about the man who is blessed. And I believe it's Psalm chapter 1, verse 3. It says he studies God's law, how frequently? Day and night. So this is a blessing that comes to people who do this when they look intently at God's word or God's law, verse 25, they gain freedom. See the word liberty there? So God's word is designed to create freedom in us. Not only is God's word a mirror, verses 23 and 24, which always tells us the truth about ourselves, but it's designed to create emancipation or it's designed to create, create freedom. It's sort of like the slaves um, following the Civil War, many of whom were illiterate, and Lincoln had, Abraham Lincoln had passed the Emancipation Proclamation, and the Constitution had been amended three times to free the slaves the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution. And yet a lot of slaves just continued to be slaves because they didn't know that in the United States their legal status had changed. So what they needed was truth. Someone had to come and explain this to them. And if no one came and explained it to them, they would continue on as slaves without having to be slaves. So that is sort of the idea that you have there in verse 25, that it's the law of God or the word of God that creates freedom or emancipation. You study the word of God and you realize that you're no longer a slave to sin. And you don't have to obey sin anymore any more than post-Civil War slaves had to obey their masters anymore. Their legal status had changed. But you would never know that unless you become a student of someone who looks intently at the law of God, which is designed to create liberty. Didn't Jesus say that in John 8, verse 32? Correct, yeah. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Free. Uh, The truth is not there to make you more miserable or unhappy or to put us into a greater state of enslavement. Uh, God gave us his word to liberate us. And that's what you see there in verse 25. That is powerful bibliology. I mean, that's why you go to a church that's a Bible church that teaches the word of God and rightfully divides it. Because as you hear it, and you read it for yourself, it's like a mirror that always tells you the truth, doesn't sugarcoat anything, and it's there, to, it's there to emancipate, it's there to liberate. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 13 says this of God's commands, to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your own good. So you notice that God's laws and his statutes are there for our own good. The deception that Satan has many people under is they think, well, if I give myself to God's word, I'm going to be a slave. When in reality, it's the opposite. The word of God liberates, the word of God emancipates. The commandments are there for my own good, for my own protection. It's like, you know, you're you're driving somewhere and you want to get somewhere quick and there's the annoying stop sign. You know, what a nuisance. I mean, why should I have to stop at a stop sign? Why can't I just go ahead and be free of the stop signs and run through the stop signs at will Why can't I declare my freedom? Well, because declaring your freedom that way, we know how that's going to end. I mean, you're going to end up getting hurt or hurting someone else. 
or, you know, God forbid you're going to get killed or kill someone else in the process. So the very thing that we think is such a nuisance and an annoyance and an encumbrance on our liberty is actually there for our own protection. So there's very, very profound um, bibliology here in James chapter 1. James chapter 1 makes tremendous contributions to that area of systematic theology called bibliology. So verse 25 goes on and it says, But the one who looks intently at the perfect law of liberty and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effective doer. Now notice that expression there, a effective doer. An effectual doer. A habitual doer. That's the person who receives the blessing that's mentioned at the end of verse 25. In Greek, it's sort of interesting. It's like, uh, you know, doer, doer is the way, kind of the way it reads. There's two words there. So this is not just a person that hears something and occasionally obeys when it's convenient, but under God's power seeks to obey God in every area of life, becoming not just a doer, but an effectual doer. There's a blessing in it for such a person. This man or woman, obviously, will be what? Blessed in what he what? What he knows. Is that what it says? What he does. So it's, it's very interesting that the word of God only promises a blessing to a person that actually applies what is taught. Do we have examples in the Bible of people that are habitual doers of the word of God? One of my favorites is Daniel. Daniel and Joseph are the only two characters in the whole Bible that I know of other than Christ where nothing negative is said about them. I mean, this is the, one of the reasons I believe the Bible had to have been written by God and not man. Because if man wrote the Bible, he would cover up his own sins. You'll notice that never happens in the Bible. Noah's sins are out there in the open. David's sins are out there in the open. Solomon's sins are right there out in the open. Peter's sins are right out there in the open. Paul's sins, when he was Saul, are right out there in the open for anybody to see. And there's only two people in the Bible that I know of where their sins are not openly disclosed. And that's Joseph, Genesis 37 through 50, and Daniel. And Daniel is not just a doer, but he's like a doer-doer. He is one of these people that is habitually obedient to God. And you see that there in Daniel chapter 6, just a few verses, so we can get an illustration of this effectual doer. Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, that's the, that's the um, edict of the Persian king Darius, that he was tricked into signing, which says no more public prayer. So I think we're, if this election gets stolen, which could happen, as I'll try to explain on Friday, we're entering a time period in the United States where these types of things, we're going to have to start thinking about them. Because the Democratic Party platform does not respect freedom of religious conscience. It's in their platform. Jim and I went through that platform on Friday in our prior pastor's point of view. Number 142, the Republican Party platform has a clause in it that does respect freedom of religious conscience. The Democratic Party does not. You can see the language very, very clearly. So you get a Democratic president and suddenly with what they call the Equality Act, uh, that gets passed and two homosexuals show up at your church and say, marry us. 
and the pastor says no, well, now the church is in legal trouble. Or someone applies for a staff position at your church and they happen to be uh, someone that's transitioning. You know, someone that, I guess, is a man but feels like a woman another type of the, another time of the day. So therefore, this man who feels like a woman is transitioning, and so that man needs to be able to go into the ladies' bathroom at your church. And so you tell such a person, sorry, we're not going to hire you as a staff member at our church. We're not going to marry people that are homosexuals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the Equality Act is now law, and now the church is under legal trouble, and you can say, well, that violates the church's religious conscience and the Democratic Party platform says we don't care, see? That's why Daniel 6 suddenly becomes a big deal because Daniel in Babylon was having to make these kinds of decisions. The Persian king said no prayer and he went ahead and prayed anyway. It says, it says, now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered into his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open towards Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks. These are all present tense verbs here. Praying and giving thanks as he had done previously. So he wasn't just a doer, he was an effectual doer. He was a doer-doer. That's the kind of person that James says is blessed. Daniel 6 verse 16 says, Then the king gave orders and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, this is the king now speaking to Daniel, Your God whom you constantly serve will deliver you. So Daniel's reputation was known even to the Persian kings. The only one that's going to be able to help you now, Daniel, is your God, who, by the way, I've seen you constantly serve. Daniel 6, verse 20, it says, When he had come near to the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king is troubled because he was talked into this edict against public prayer. He was deceived into it. And according to the laws of the Medes and the Persians, once the Medes and the Persians pass a law, it can't be revoked. You'll see a reference to that in Esther 8, verse 8. So once the king was fooled into passing this law, the king had to throw Daniel into the lion's den. And the king is saying, I can't help you. The only one that's going to be able to help you is God. When he had been taken near to the den to Daniel, he, that's the king, cried out with a loud voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve been able to deliver you from the lions? And we know the answer to that. It's a happy ending there. God did deliver. But you'll notice that the Persian king refers to Daniel as the, as the person who constantly serves God. That's what James is dealing with here. In verse 25, the person who is blessed, the person who is blessed is an effectual doer, just like Daniel. So he goes on in verse 25 and he says, this man, what man? The doer doer. This man will be blessed, not in what he knows, but what he does. So it's very clear that Blessing in the Christian life comes from doing. Hearing, but hearing is not a first step. Knowledge turns into wisdom. Gnosis turns into Sophia. Knowledge turns into Hokama or wisdom, and it's consistently applied. And James is saying this is how to achieve a practical righteousness that's pleasing to God. This is how to let your practice catch up with your position Jesus said if you know these things you are blessed if you do them how about the book of Joshua 
Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says the exact same thing. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. That sounds like Psalm 1 verse 3 that we referenced a little earlier. You shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do, not pass an exam. Passing exams are wonderful, but that was never designed by God to be a final step. You must be careful to do according to all that is written in it. That's what Daniel was like. He obeyed the parts of the Bible, Hebrew Bible that he agreed with, and maybe there were things that were harder on him, but he obeyed those also. To the point where he wouldn't even let an edict from the Persian king disrupt his personal prayer life. You may be careful to do all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have success. Prosperous and success, isn't that what we all want? I mean, isn't that why we work ourselves to death? Isn't that why we get up early and go to bed late? We want to prosper and be successful. Well, God says to Joshua, here in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, here's how to make yourself prosperous and successful. Meditate on the law of God day and night and do all according that is written in it. So blessing in the Christian life comes from doing, not just hearing. That's James' point. Now here's a verse that has really helped me over the years when I was a new student at Dallas Seminary, I remember Charles Swindoll at one of our chapel services preached on this and it was very helpful to me. It's describing Ezra and Ezra's calling as a priest and it says this of Ezra in Ezra chapter 7 verse 10, for Ezra had firm, firmly resolved to study the law of the Lord. And I remember Swindoll said, that's why you're here at this school. You know, you're really not here to evangelize the city of Dallas. <laughs> I remember him saying that. You're here to study the word of God. That's why God has put you here. But you'll notice that the verse doesn't stop there. For Ezra firmly resolved to study the law of the Lord and to what? Practice it. And to what? Teach his statutes and ordinances to Israel. Do you see the order there? Number one, you study because you can't practice what you don't know. Number two, under God's power, you start putting it into practice. And then and only then are you in a position to teach it to someone else. There's a lot of people out there that want to be teachers. In fact, in this book, we're going to learn in James chapter 3, verse 1... Let many of you, let few of you presume to be teachers. I mean, there's a lot of people out there, they want platforms, they want audiences, they want pulpits. And you listen to some of the things they say, and it's pretty obvious they haven't spent a lot of time studying. And then there are others that study, but what happens is they don't practice it themselves. And they get exposed as lacking integrity or being unethical. And I know God well enough to know that he will not be mocked. If someone is standing behind a pulpit representing God and is not practicing what he's telling others to do, then eventually it'll come to the surface because that's God's nature. For Ezra firm, firmly resolved to study the law of the Lord and to practice it. And then the last step is to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. So I was sitting there in chapel and I said, well, Lord, I, I want to be just like that. I want to be a good student of your word. And I, I want to put it into practice and in my personal life. And if it's your decree and grace that you'd put me in a position to teach to other people, I want that too. But I don't want number three without bypassing the steps of number one and number two. See that? So this is what James is, is dealing with here. 
being a doer of the Word of God. The blessing in the Christian life comes from doing. So, how do we obey God? Three things. Number one, slowness to speech and anger, verses 19 and 20. Covered that last time. Number two, the need to obey God's word, verses 21 through 25. We just finished covering that. And the last thing that we need to obey God is we need what is called true religion. If you heard my sermon on Sunday, um, you, you heard I was against religion because religion is man's attempt to earn favor before God through his own works. So religion may not be the best word used to describe verses 26 and 27. Maybe a better word would be piety or spirituality or maybe letting your practice catch up with your position. So that's what James is dealing with there in verses 26 and 27. So verse 26, he explains what authentic piety is not. And then in verse 27, he explains what authentic piety is. So James, what is true spirituality not? And James says, I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 26. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue. Gee, James, don't beat around the bush. Come right out and tell me what you think. If anyone thinks himself to be religious yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. So what is true spirituality not? It's, you know, we would call it this, stung by the tongue. I mean, a person is really not walking in practical righteousness when the two-by-two slab of mucous membrane between the gums is is running constantly in an out-of-control way. In fact, when we get to James 3, 1 through 12, James is going to explain that that two-by-two slab of mucous membrane called the tongue, although it's a small part of the body, it's like a spark that can set a whole forest on fire. And we've already had a little bit about stung by the tongue in verse 19, uh, where James says, everyone must be quick to hear and slow to speak. So if my mouth is running off sarcasm, venom, bitterness, derisive comments, um, and I'm going to church week after week after week and hearing good teaching, then James is basically saying whatever piety I have, it's really worthless or it's not worth much. Now, that word worthless, this is very important. Because when you go over to James 2.20, he uses a similar word, useless. He says in James 2.20, But are you willing to recognize, you foolish man, that faith without works is useless? Uh, Here James says our piety is uh, worthless. Worthless. Chapter 1, verse 26, useless, chapter 2, verse 20. So what James is saying here is not that your faith doesn't exist. You follow that? That's very important to understand. What he's saying is it's it's not good for anything. It's good in the sense that your fire insurance is paid up and you're not going to hell. But as far as God actually strategically using our lives to accomplish eternal things, God can't use it. And this is very important because a lot of people, when they get to James 2, verse 20, particularly in Reformed theology, the way they interpret James 2 is they say, if you don't have works, then your faith never existed. And that's not what James is saying. James is not saying your faith doesn't exist. What he's saying is your faith is worthless or useless in the sense that God can't use it 
to accomplish eternal things on the earth, which is why we're here, right? I mean, why doesn't God just take us to heaven after I become a Christian? Well, because God wants to use my life for his purposes. And that's the whole point of John 15 in the upper room, the vine in the branch. He talks about how you cannot bear fruit of your own, but only as the branch abides in the vine does it become fruitful. And only then does it produce fruit that will last. So what James is saying is if I'm going to church and I'm orthodox in my doctrine and I'm hearing good sermons, yet my tongue is out of control, then yeah, I'm going to heaven and my fire insurance is paid up and I'm not going to hell, which is wonderful, but my faith is basically worthless or useless in terms of being used by God for his eternal purposes. He's not saying it doesn't exist, which is the common misconception in Reformed theology. So what you're doing in James 2 is largely controlled by decisions you've already made in James 1. When we get to James 2, I'm not going to say if you don't have works, you're not a Christian. 99% of preachers will tell you that. That's not what James is saying, though. What James is saying is if you don't have works, then your faith is unproductive, not non-existent. And so that's why it's helpful to pay attention to words like useless and ineffective um, and the like. So what does he say there in verse 20, 26? What is true spirituality not? But if a man thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. He's deceived, this man, because he thinks he's spiritual. But James says, you're not spiritual. You have a saving faith, but you certainly don't have a serving faith, is the point James is getting at. So that's what true piety is not. It's, it's not orthodoxy plus gossip. Orthodoxy plus sarcasm. Orthodoxy plus unedifying speech. Uh, orthodoxy plus earthy speech. That's not what true spirituality is. So James, that's what true spirituality is not. Can you please tell us what true spirituality is? And James says, I'm glad you asked. Verse 27. By the way, on the subject of worthless and useless, we're not dealing with justification, but we're dealing with what? Sanctification. sanctification. This is all, the whole book of James is middle tent salvation stuff. And you guys know this chart very well, right? So I, I mean, I'd love to go through it with you tonight, but time is running out. So what then is true religion? And we're going to wrap up tonight with verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. And he mentions two things here. But notice before we get to the second half of verse 27, he mentions undefiled and pure religion. I cannot help but thinking of Thomas Jefferson when I read that. Because a lot of people the secularists are very down on Thomas Jefferson in the sense that they think he didn't have any respect for the Bible because of statements he made throughout his life. And I think they're misunderstanding Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was all about Jesus. And he was all about true Christianity as espoused by Jesus and not by what he thought were corruptions of Christianity by denominationalism. So when Thomas Jefferson is criticizing allegedly Christianity, what he's really criticizing is corruptions of it. He was into pure and undefiled religion. And so Thomas Jefferson, in a letter to Benjamin Rush, Thomas Jefferson, of course, wrote the Declaration of Independence Benjamin Rush is a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson said, my views 
are the result of a life of inquiry and reflection and very different from the anti-Christian system imputed to me by those who know nothing of my opinions. To the corruptions of Christianity, I am indeed opposed, but to the genuine precepts of Jesus himself, not to the genuine precepts of Jesus himself. I am a Christian in the only sense which he wished anyone to be, sincerely attached to his doctrine in preference to all others. In other words, forget denominationalism, let's go back to what Jesus said, pure, what he called pure and undefiled religion. Thomas Jefferson goes on and he says, his, that's Christ, system of morals, if filled up in the style and the spirit of the rich fragments he left us, would be the most perfect and sublime that has ever been taught by man. His moral doctrines were more pure and perfect. Isn't that sound like James here? Pure and undefiled religion. His morals and doctrines were more pure and perfect than those of the most correct philosophers. Gathering all into one family under the bonds of love, charity, peace, common wants, and common aids. A development of this head will events. I love how these older guys wrote. It's just beautiful language. What would these guys do with Twitter? Where they only get 25 characters or something to communicate. Uh, a development of this head will evince the peculiar superiority of the system of Jesus above all others. The precepts and philosophy and of the Hebrew code laid hold of actions only, but he, Jesus, pushed his scrutinies into the heart of men. He erected his tribunal in the region of his thoughts and purified the waters at the fountainhead. Close quote. What Jefferson is saying here is everybody else is talking about what, what, what's going on on the outside. Ethics. Whereas Jesus says, if you look at a woman with lust, you're a what? You're an adulterer. If you're unjustifiably angry with your brother to the point where you wish them dead, you're a what? A murderer. That's what impressed Jefferson about Christ, is no other philosopher did that. And what Thomas Jefferson really didn't like is he didn't like corruptions of the original version of Jesus. He was into completely pure and undefiled um, religion. This is the kind of thing that James is talking about. So how do you know if you're practicing pure and undefiled religion? By the way, I bring these quotes to your attention because your kids and your grandkids are being taught something different with almost no primary source data behind it. They're basically being taught that the founders were deists and you know, terrible people. Why is that? Because the powers that be want to replace the existing United States government as it currently exists with communism or Marxism. And you can't do that unless you trash the origin of America. If I'm a salesman and I'm trying to talk you into a new toothpaste, I can't do that unless I ask you what toothpaste you're currently using and don't you know that that toothpaste is dated and it destroys your, what do you call it on your teeth there? It starts with an E. Enamel. Enamel. So until you're open to that idea, I can't give you the new toothpaste, right? So that's why your kids and grandkids are always being taught now by so many sources to disrespect the founding fathers. But founding fathers weren't perfect people, but you can see from statements like this that Thomas Jefferson was not hostile to Christianity. In fact, in his day, they were calling him, an, they were calling him as advocating an anti-Christian system, falsely imputed to him. And he's correcting the record here with uh, Benjamin Rush. So what then is true religion? Number one, it is ministering to widows and orphans in their distress. Verse 27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress. Why are widows and orphans in distress? Because when this was written, there's no safety net. 
There's no insurance policies. There's no protection. And so if you are a widow or an orphan, you are in trouble. And you were the most vulnerable of society, and somebody had to look out for you. By the way, God always looked out for the widows and the orphans. Did you know that? I mean, I, I just started looking up this week, widows and orphans. You wouldn't believe how many verses there are. But Exodus twenty two twenty two, you shall not oppress any widow or orphan. If you repress, oppress him at all, and if he cries out to me, I will surely hear his cry. And my anger will be kindled, and I will kill you with the sword. And then what's going to happen to your wives? They're going to become widows. <laughs> and your children are going to become what? Orphans. That's, that's, not my, that's not what I said. That's God. Exodus 22. 22 through 24, Deuteronomy 27, 19. Cursed is the one who distorts justice to a stranger, an orphan, or a widow. Isaiah 1, 17. Learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, obtain justice for the orphan. Plead the widow's case. In fact, paganism... God here is describing in the cycles of discipline a pagan nation coming against Israel. And they're characterized as a nation who has no respect for the young, the old, nor shows favor to the young. So Christianity, that's why the Christians are the ones that invented all the hospitals, right? Even in this area, what do we have? Methodist this and St. Luke's. I mean, it's not the atheists that came up with hospitals. It's Christians. Atheists or pagans have no respect for the vulnerable. Christians practicing true religion have always had respect for the vulnerable, like the widows and orphans, because it's in the Bible. So true religion is ministering to the most distressed, the, the people that need help the most. Like in the first century and even to today, widows and orphans and the last thing or the second thing and with this we're finished true religion authentic spirituality is is its moral purity so verse 27 pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God our God and father is this to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Who is running the world system? Satan is. The world system is described in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Where it says all that is in the world, by the way, the word world is cosmos, where we get the word cosmopolitan, which is an actual magazine, isn't it? It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God continues forever. That's why verse 15 of 1 John 2 says, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Once I become worldly, I, I fall in love with Satan's domain. That happened to somebody in the Bible, by the way, named Demas. Demas bailed out at the end of Paul's life. And Paul writes about it in 2 Timothy 4.10. Demas, now was Demas a believer? I think he was. Or else why would Paul make Demas part of his missionary team? Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. That's how the world works. It presents itself as such an allurement that it alienates our affections from God. Romans 12, 2, Philip's version says, Do not let the world squeeze you into its mold. Jesus says, John 15, 18, and 19, that... If you're a friend of God, 
you become an enemy of what? The world. Why would he say that? Because the world is organized by Satan. And that fits with James 4.4, 4, right? James talked about avoid worldliness here at the end of chapter 1, but he's really going to get into it in James 4.4. 4. And there he explains that friendship with the world is enmity against God. Friendship with God is enmity against the world. Because Satan is orchestrating the cosmos, the system of philosophy, through lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, you cannot achieve a practical righteousness that pleases God with one foot in Christianity and the other foot in love with the world system. It's, it's impossible to live for God that way. And when we, when we try to do that, we're really not practicing undefiled, authentic Christianity. So, wowzer. Verses 19 through 27 is all about obedience to the word of God. Faith that obeys through three things. Slowness in speaking and anger, verses 19 and 20. A need for receiving and obeying God's word, 21 through 25. And then a need to practice true religion, verses 26 and 27. True religion is not unbridled speech. But true religion is ministering to those in distress and keeping oneself unstained by the world. Gee, the problem with the Bible, there's just not enough to apply to life, is there? Goodness gracious. I don't, know how we, I don't know how I got out of that paragraph in one piece. So next week, oh, we never do this, do we? We never show favoritism. I mean, not here at this church. That's the church down the street, right? We don't show favor to people based on how they look and what kind of car they drive. That's not us, but... If this happens to apply to you, you might want to show up next week and we'll talk about it. So let's stop at that point. If folks got to collect their young ones or otherwise take off, this would be a good time to do that.